Uh, we have Fawn Sharp who will be giving our keynote. She is president of Quinault Indian Nation and president of the National Congress of American Indians. Welcome, Fawn. Hi, thank you. Siokwil. Oh, Yohach, Anstrag Haiwishka. Good afternoon. My name is Fawn Sharp, and I do serve as president of the Quinault Indian Nation and president of the National Congress of American Indians. I was so happy uh, and honored to accept this invitation. Thank you for uh, reaching out to tribal leaders so that we could be part of this very important conversation. You know, I've been telling people a lot lately that uh, th this entire world is facing uh, multiple apocalyptic challenges. Not, a, not only are we facing a global pandemic, we are facing the impacts of climate change. And I've pointed out that tribal leaders and tribal citizens all across this country have long known that this day of reckoning is coming. Because from our perspective, what we see, even with a global pandemic and the impacts of climate change, uh, these are just symptoms of a much deeper imbalance that begin not just in 2020 or even last year or a decade ago or even a lifetime ago. These imbalances begin centuries ago. And so while these are scary times, I've also really encourage tribal leaders to embrace this moment as a very sacred moment because our generation is confronted with just unimaginable challenges. Um, earlier this week, I was asked uh, by a reporter some questions, and it made me think about what would I have told a, a young um, President Sharp back in 2006 when I first started working on the impacts of climate change uh, what, what would I be telling that person, that tribal leader? And one of the things I would be saying is, uh, uh, you're absolutely right in, in putting the world on notice about uh, the impacts of climate change are only going to increase in both intensity and frequency, because that was something that tribal nations were warning the rest of the world, because tribal nations follow science. And, and we were based on science taking policy positions and putting people on notice. We don't know what's gonna happen in the future, but we know that the impacts are gonna be more intense and more frequent. And I, I would also tell that, that young tribal leader, be prepared for 2020, because not only are you gonna be facing a, a global pandemic, that's a, a deadly pandemic without a vaccine, you're gonna be uh, facing six consecutive years in a row of mega fires where the entire west coast is on fire and under a dark cloud of smoke you're going to be facing an eastern seaboard where uh, major cities like new york city and new orleans are going to just uh, sustain unmanageable uh, property loss and loss of life and death and the entire eastern seaboard is going to be torn apart with hurricanes and tornadoes and so while we knew back then based on science and based on oral tradition and, and history and the teachings of our ancestors, that we have to heed these signs. We have to heed science. And we have to listen to the stories that our elders have told us about the imbalance that has happened. And so for me this week, it was, it was really a moment to, to take pause and think back to uh, where we started in, in this climate fight well over a decade ago and all of those things that we knew to be true, and, and now the whole world is witnessing all of these things unfold right in front of us. And these are dark times, they're scary times, and not only is our environmental landscape on fire, our political landscape, our social landscape, everything is uh, uh, just so uncertain. And there's a lot of things that we, we just don't know what the future's gonna hold. It seems day by day, Things are, are getting worse and worse and worse. But I, I also want to encourage everyone to consider this, that while there's a great deal of things that we don't know about, there's a lot that we, we, we do know. And there are things for which not only is there certainty, but there's, there's um, a, a path forward that is proven to not only be effective for us in this generation, but it's proven through, through time. Uh, the timeless values that we hold as, as Native people, the, the timeless teachings and the ancient teachings. And I encourage everyone that from my perspective and living through all this as a tribal leader over the last decade and a half, 
it are, it, it's those principles that have sustained us and will continue to guide us uh, through these multiple apocalyptic challenges facing our generation. And so what, what are those teachings? That's kind of, uh, what I want to spend some time in my remarks to talk about. Those, those timeless teachings that we have, first and foremost, uh, we have each other. And as tribal peoples, we've, we've confronted a lot. We've been through generation after generation. Um, and, and it's multi-generational now, the, the multi-generational trauma and, and adversity and social, economic, political oppression. But with each uh, chapter of adversity, we've found strength in, in that pain and we've found strength in that suffering. And we've found uh, strength in just our ability to unify. And when I talk to people outside of Indian country about what we're facing, I, I've encouraged them to consider our traditional values and our teachings. Right now, there's, there's a question about food security and food sovereignty in this global pandemic. We have an opportunity to create a public health care recovery plan that looks at traditional ecological knowledge, that looks at uh, many of our, our foods that have been within our communities uh, and passed down generation after generation. And it's those type of foods that have sustained us that is going to provide the resilience that our people need to, to not only survive this pandemic, but to be resilient and to come out of the pandemic stronger. We also know that uh, we're, we're facing economic collapse and we need an economic recovery plan uh, that's going to, and it's not just in this country, it's globally. Right now, world leaders are, are talking about how are we going to recover a global economy in the aftermath of COVID-19. Well, in those discussions, many are talking uh, inside as well as outside of the United States about the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 to indigenous populations and the indigenous communities throughout the world. They know that we're vulnerable and they know that we've not had much in the way of economic relief over the years. And as the world recalibrates the global economy and considers investment in renewable energies and that new economy that those of us that work in the area of climate change uh, know to be true, just as we knew 10 years ago that the world is going to be much different, that the impacts of climate change are going to intensify and they're going to become worse and they're going to become more frequent. We also know that there's an unimaginable future on the positive side. We know there's an unimaginable future where science and technology is coming together to create new sectors that we never even thought of. At the Quinault Nation, we're having to relocate our villages to higher ground, and we're considering biomass, we're considering solar, we're considering cross-laminate timber, uh, timber where uh, buildings are constructed. Instead of steel beams, they're cross-laminate, they're lighter, they're cheaper, they sequester carbon. These are the kind of technologies that we know are on the horizon, and so much is being invested into research and innovation. And just as daunting as the reports that the scientists deliver to us about the impact of climate change, the flip side of that, there are exciting things that are being uh, delivered to us uh, day in, day out about new and emerging technologies and about uh, success stories of countries, of cities, of counties, of states that are employing new and emerging technology and they're coming together. And so I think it's very important for us to understand at this time that yes, these are times of great uncertainty, but there's a lot of things that, that are certain. And when we combine our traditional ecological knowledge and the centuries of knowledge that we bring to the table, consider the breadth of that opportunity. We, we can stand on the foundation of knowledge and wisdom that's been passed down to us through the ages, that's centuries old, that's proven. And at the same time, we can be part of a much broader conversation where we can look seven generations into the future and plan for that new economy and, and those new technologies and, and join partners across many sectors. Because I've come to know and realize that while there's a great deal of division in this country on issues, even like climate change, there's, there's a, a great deal of ability for us to come to common ground. So when we talk about 
the opportunities for which uh, tribal nations can stand. We, we find that there are leaders. Um, there are leaders in the Republican Party. There are leaders in the Dem among Democrats. There are leaders in uh, the faith-based communities. There are leaders in colleges and universities and the business sector, even among scientists and our youth. I mean, who would have thought we'd have so many youth across the globe who are championing uh, tr climate change? They're representing a true and authentic voice when it comes to climate change. And so it's really important for us in this time and in, in this hour, uh, this hour of great need, that we stand on the foundations of our teachings and that we reach out because no one is immune from climate change and we're, we're all deeply impacted but we all have something to contribute to the conversation to ensure that every bit of knowledge is on the table because a, a, an effective climate change strategy is gonna have to be uh, strategic, it's gonna have to be inclusive, it's gonna have to ensure that uh, tri tribal nations are at the table and, and the world has long been willing and is embracing all that we have to offer, uh, every bit of our knowledge and our solutions. and so. While these are scary times, it, it's also a moment and an opportunity to embrace these times as sacred and to search deep within our hearts, our soul, our conscience, to resist the temptation to become apathetic, to resist the temptation to become divisive, to resist the temptation to, to feel like there's nothing we can do uh, because there's so much that we can do. And so at the National Congress of American Indians, I, I just want to shift to all of what I've said to translate to some of the things that we are calling upon Congress to do and some of the action items and steps that we're, we're doing in, in the very near future. So uh, many of you may have heard of, um, there's a report called uh, the Broken Promises Report. It was uh, delivered by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights uh, to Congress, and it concludes not one federal agency is, is living up to its trust responsibility that uh, tribal nations are chronically underfunded. We're severely underfunded, not just today, but if you go back year after year, uh, we've just not uh, kept pace with uh, spending power. Even with federal agencies having increases to their budget, those increases haven't kept pace with our needs and spending and, and just simply the rate of inflation. And so we are uh, working on congressional oversight hearings to take a deeper look into what's happening across Indian country, and it's every sector. It's, it's healthcare, it's education, it's law enforcement, it, it's science, it's all of these different sectors that we, we manage within every tribal nation. And it's our goal to not only uh, shed light on the, the chronic underfunding, but the, as the world has witnessed, uh, these, these, uh, this chronic underfunding has led to the, the place where uh, tribal nations and our citizens have become among the most vulnerable uh, to the impacts of COVID-19. We have the highest rates of infection. And at one point, the infection rate at the Navajo Nation was, was greater than any state in the country. And the, the entire world has seen the disproportionate impacts to our communities. And, and so while we've prepared to advance uh, economic policies and tax policies, uh, within Congress, and we're continuing to champion those things. We are, are calling on uh, Congress to conduct some oversight hearings around this and build a, basically a Marshall Plan for Indian Country. And within that Marshall Plan of a public health care recovery plan and an economic recovery plan, we want to include climate-related uh, impacts and climate-related solutions. And so this is going to be an, an opportunity for us to really enlist the brain trust of all of Indian country. We have so many incredible tribal nations that have scientists that they, they choose, they could work anywhere else that they, they would like. And um, they have that expertise, but they choose to stay within our tribal nations and, and serve uh, tribal communities. We, we have uh, intertribal organizations. We have very specific science, uh, local fisheries uh, commissions in, with, with climate scientists. And, and so it's our goal to really uh, bring together Indian country's brain trusts around some solutions for both a public health care recovery plan and an economic recovery plan as an answer to the longstanding question, how are we going to close the gap in Indian country? How are we going to meet those needs? And I, I, I had a conversation this morning with a, a senator and I, 
I made the point that, you know, we've done all we can as tribal nations to hold our trustee accountable to fully fund us. We've done all we can to create a tax base and generate revenues. And case after case, we're faced in litigation just to exercise a basic fundamental power that every government can exercise. And so in the absence of our trustee, in the absence of our ability to, to act as governments to raise our own revenues, we're forced to generate um, profits through commercial entities like casinos, like tourism, like all the different things that we do to try to generate profits instead of governmental revenues. And so those are some of the, the conversations where having a discussion about climate policy and that new and emerging economy that, that awaits us. And we can work on that economy with a foundation of traditional and ecological knowledge and science and really bridge that uh, body of knowledge. And I just know that this generation, while we are facing so many challenges, this is truly a gift and an opportunity. And we have not withered uh, like fire in a, you know, like paper in a fire. Uh, in, in the middle of the flames, there's an opportunity to, to be like steel, to find our strength, to dig down uh, into the resilience that has not only sustained us through through many challenges across the ages and across the centuries, but we were born for this moment, we are ready for this moment, and we were gifted uh, this opportunity and time. And so while everything is on fire, uh, well, the, the entire West Coast has been engulfed in flames and we are facing storm after storm, apocalyptic challenge after apocalyptic challenge. The path forward is, is really to, to come together to know and, and understand it and truly take to heart the unique position that tribal nations have and, and the wisdom and knowledge that we all possess and, and come to the table to forge real solutions that are not only proven, but they're proven through the ages. And I, I am just so grateful for the opportunities like this because it, it really is about being able to have not only conversations uh, here within the United States and among our, our federal family of uh, federal partners where tribes have an opportunity to directly engage and formulate good policy, but it's going to be that foundation where the, the, the nation, the United States, can continue to lead the global conversations because that really, um, we're at that pivotal time where time is of the essence, and if we don't really come together to seize this moment and this opportunity, we just may hit that point of, of no return. And, and that's where um, I've often been asked about what, what's motivated me as an individual uh, in the climate fight. And, and I point to people about my first year in office. Uh, I really wanted to reach out to our elders and our citizens about a community-driven agenda. And I was informed about our prized sockeye salmon, the blueback salmon. It's a unique sockeye that returns to the Quinault. In the 50s and 60s, we had millions of sockeye. Uh, year after year, just millions of sockeye returned to the Quinault. The year I got elected, we only had 3,000. And two years ago, we only harvested 27, and, and we've had to shut the fishery down over the last uh, three consecutive years. And when I delved into the issue of why our sockeye are disappearing, I began to find out about ocean acidification. I began to find out about melting glaciers and uh, the sea level rise, it's taking out our community at a, at a rate where we're having to relocate two of our main villages immediately to higher ground. And so I took a helicopter flight to look over uh, the Anderson Glacier. And when our helicopter came over the ridge, I didn't see a glacier. I saw what looked like a, a murky mud puddle where a glacier once stood. And so to come face to face with the impacts, and I, I grew up in a time and an era where people were jailed and beaten for exercising their treaty rights here in the Pacific Northwest. So I have a, a date, a very deep value and a story about uh, our tribe's effort to, to keep a, tr a prize resource, to fight for a, a prize resource, to give up freedoms and liberties for that sacred salmon, and to know that the macro environmental impacts that we're facing have the ability and are wiping them out to, to nearly nothing is something that has motivated and inspired me for, for well over a decade on, on this fight. And so 
year after year, it, things are intensifying. Year after year, we're watching our salmon decline and plummet sharply. Year after year, we're seeing the other impacts of, of climate change in the Salish Sea, and it, it's heartbreaking. But that's, again, a point in, in a place where we can't give up. Time is of the essence. We cannot give up. We have to keep doing all we can. We have to keep coming together to having sessions like this. We need to build, you know, build our agenda here domestically, advance it internationally, because it's going to be key for the United States uh, to come to terms with not only the impacts of climate change to, to this country, but what it's doing uh, within our own tribal nations. And so those are things I think the world is prepared. I think the world is ready. And we've known that this day of reckoning has come. Uh, we've known that this day of reckoning for generations of environmental exploits are going to need to be addressed. And when that time has come, we've wanted to be prepared. And I believe we are prepared. We are gifted this special time. We know that the hour is here. We know we have to come together and rise up to meet this challenge and do all we can. And so anytime I have an opportunity like this to address folks and, and, and share with you just a little bit about my perspective and what we're doing, why it's so important, and, and just to continue to uplift every one of you that are watching. I'm, I'm so grateful that you're in this fight, you're in the good fight, as Billy Frank Jr. would often say, you know, keep up the good fight. And um, please know that uh, I, I'm here to stand with, with each and every one of you. And if there's ever a moment I can be of help or service in, in your fight uh, to continue to roll back the impacts of climate change, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. I am, I'm fairly accessible. I, I love engaging with um, events like this, and I, I really love engaging with our youth. So uh, I'm look forward, looking forward to a continued dialogue and an opportunity for our paths to cross again. And my hands are raised to each and every one of you. Siokwil, thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Fawn. That was so much information and so much energy in, in 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> do you have time to stay on to field any questions? Yes, absolutely. Okay, I just let the um, audience know that we are accepting questions in our chat, so we will be monitoring that. Um, okay. And I just think I will start it off by asking, um, what uh, what are, what are some of the other um, initiatives that NCAI is working on at this moment? Yes, uh, excellent question. We just had a, a board meeting this morning, uh, a retreat, so uh, the timing is good. Yes, so we're working on uh, uh, an, an effort to bring about uh, truth and reconciliation in this country. Um, that's a big initiative. Uh, if any of you have watched the, the state of uh, Indian Nations address that I delivered in January, I raised this issue because uh, it was quite apparent to me, and this was before all of the, the social and racial uh, unrest and injustices that we've witnessed unfold uh, seemingly hour by hour in this country in 2020, uh, it was very clear to me that uh, this country, uh, you know, has had some basic foundational principles of, of truth, of equality, and it, it seems as though people are understanding and realizing that we did not deal with all these injustices back in the 60s. I think it was a rude awakening for some people to know that there's still such a sharp and a great division in this country. But, you know, at, at one point there was a challenge. Um, could, a, could a country so dedicated and so uh, conceived long endure? And, and that was, you know, during the Civil War. And we're, we're facing that again, but I firmly believe that the foundational principles that transcend generations and that transcend borders, the, the, the opportunity for us to continue to work on a, a country where people are unified and where there is equality and where there is justice, uh, I believe in that wholeheartedly. And I know that a country that was built on those foundational principles that learned from our tribal nations uh, upon European contact, that those are the, another part of the timeless values that we, we hold as, as Native people. And so for this country to really begin reconciling and come to terms, they need to go back to that very first chapter of, of genocide in this country. 
before they could even begin to deal with slavery and all the subsequent other, uh, you know, uh, political and social oppression of, of other communities. And so I, I just know that um, once we uh, can, can achieve a level of, of truth and reconciliation, only then will this country have a shot at healing. Only then will this country be able to emerge out of this just dark, dark chapter in U.S. history. And so I, I've reached out to uh, a number of folks, uh, leaders across uh, Indian country, uh, to members of Congress, and, you know, seeking an executive order on truth and reconciliation. And so that's a, a major an initiative because it, it affects every generation. And I, I've been asked, you know, who could... Who could be the voice of, of that uh, initiative? And my first answer was, I, I believe this is a, a place where we need to keep uh, open space for our kids. Because I, I've come to learn that every single day, our kids are facing uh, institutional racism. Uh, when, one weekend, I heard three different stories. I heard stories of a kid in a, a, a local basketball game that was kicked, and, and the person that kicked this kid I uh, gave the referee a high five. Well, at the same time, a girl in the Southwest was forced to cut her braids. And at the same time, uh, that same weekend, I saw a press report coming out of the Cherokee Nation where Chief Hoskin put the schools on notice. If you do not deal with institutional racism, we may have to withhold our uh, charitable uh, funding to these school districts. And, and so to me, that signaled that our, our, you know, our children are confronted with institutional racism every single day that they're in the classroom or on the basketball court or in the field. And so, uh, you know, that's a, a major priority. Absolutely. Um, and that's a perfect segue into some of our next questions um, that we've been receiving on chat, which have to do with our next generation of youth. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is one piece of advice that you would have for youth that are watching this session in regards to the pathway to national indigenous leadership? Yes. Uh, my first advice would be to embrace, uh, embrace, em embrace your identity, your culture, your teachings, your songs, your dance. Uh, I'm an example of someone who, who was told to go off and get an education. And I went to some of the, the best schools in the world. And it wasn't until I came home and I got into a, a canoe and I, I learned about our, our songs and the power that lies within the strength of our the spiritual dimension of who we are as native people it's the strongest and it's the most beautiful dimension and that drumbeat that heartbeat that you hear no matter where you are in any country that has no beginning and no end so i would strongly advise anyone who wants a path of leadership embrace that core part of our identity that core part of our spirituality it'll take you to places you can't even imagine Excellent. Thank you. There's another one that has to do with our youth as well. Um, would you encourage youth to engage in climate programs, develop environmental engineering to address climate change? Uh, sorry, develop environmental engineering models to address climate change. Yes, uh, certainly. Th those are other examples of where I think traditional knowledge can meet new and emerging science. And so, uh, yes, I, I believe that there's a full spectrum in, in our body of knowledge uh, going back to, you know, generations of ancestral teachings to employing new and emerging and best science, those things that we've not yet had a chance to discover that are going to make a big difference because it, it's going to take a full body of knowledge to strategically and effectively uh, deal with the impacts of climate change. Thank you, Fawn. Uh, no yeah, other questions have, have come through, but we do have a question from our Tribal Leader Summit ho um, coordinator, Mita. That sounds great. Hi, Fawn. Hi. So Hi. I just kind of wanted to uh, ask what plans there are for helping to get out the Native vote, especially amongst COVID. I know that that's a big push that we have every election cycle is getting yeah. out the native vote and making sure that there's um, information for elders to read in their languages and trying to get the voice heard. Uh, but this year is exceptionally difficult. So what is the plan? 
Yes, so uh, NCI has a, a four pillar plan uh, and we're uh, well into that plan. So the first part of it was uh, education and outreach. So uh, the Congress has a, a toolbox, if you will, uh, for um, flyers, for technical support, for the uh, native vote coordinators, for uh, mini grants, for small funding. Uh, we also are making available uh, resources for PPE, um, masks, shields, gloves, etc. Anything that any tribe might need for uh, voting booths. Uh, we also are undertaking um, an effort to work with partners, including the nonprofit uh, Four Directions, on voter suppression. We've had to file lawsuits just to gain basic access to voting. Uh, there were a couple of attempts uh, in North Dakota, I mean, in other parts of the country where there was an aggressive attempt to suppress the native vote. And we came out in force. We challenged those. We, we brought lawsuits. We prevailed. And the, the backlash to all that is Indian country came out stronger. Um, and it, there, there's a short film, uh, the story of what happened in North Dakota, and it's very inspiring. And it it goes to prove that even when people try to, to suppress us, we respond and we come back even stronger. And that's exactly what's happened in the efforts to suppress the native vote over the last, um, since the last election. Uh, the other thing that we are doing is uh, data analysis. Because of our new normal and because we are uh, also evolving our, our Get Out the Native Vote programs, we are gonna be analyzing uh, the things that work, the things that didn't work, areas where we need improvement, how to use social media. And so um, if you go to our website uh, at the Congress, the National Congress of American Indians website, we have a whole section on native vote with uh, resources, with ideas, with how you can connect in uh, any way that we can support. So those are uh, some of the things that we're doing. Great, thank you again. Uh, we did have a couple other questions and uh, I wanted to just ask um, another question about youth. So um, you are going to be our transition into the youth program today. So we okay. hope we hope we have a, quite a few of our youth that, that joined early and um, we're wondering what is your advice that you would have for indigenous youth that are con considering going into law school <laughs> Or perhaps they want to take the same path that you did. And um, uh, how do you get to be the president of the National Congress of American Indians? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, the great question. Uh, yes, I would. I would strongly encourage any youth that seeks law as a profession. Uh, it's a wonderful profession. If if I could go back in time and choose any field to study, I would choose law a thousand times over. And uh, when I was a a young child, our tribe was facing a, a fishing rights controversy here in the Pacific Northwest, otherwise known as the Bolt Decision. I knew what treaty abrogation meant at eight years old. I knew that there are people out to abrogate our treaties. And my grandfather pulled me aside and, and said, look, if you pursue law, understand it's a social tool, it's a political tool, it's an economic tool. And the law trains you, uh, trains you to spot issues. It trains you to, to analyze facts against the law, it trains you to, to seek justice and come out with, you know, fair and just conclusions. And so you find that people who are trained in the law, you find them in many sectors outside of actually practicing law, but those skill sets are invaluable because you're, you're trained to pursue justice and you're trained to, to try to solve problems. And so I, yes, absolutely. I would uh, encourage anyone. And then once you uh, go that route and, and you become uh, one who critically looks at things and fairly looks at things, leadership was, is going to naturally follow. And so if you take a warrior lawyer, someone who's trained in the law, and someone who is is really embracing their cultures and their traditions and their, their values and know who they are as a Native person, watch out. Um, so the, the, the opportunities are, are endless. And how about uh, becoming the uh, president of the National Congress of American Indians? Yes, um, that's a, a, another good question. Um, you know, when I first ran uh, for public office, it wasn't a personal aspiration. Uh, I, in fact, I asked some of our, I'm only the ninth president at Quinault since the turn of the last century. And 
when our last president announced her retirement, tribal uh, elders talked to me about running, and I said, "That's um, I'm trained to see truth, justice, fairness, politics, tribal politics. It just doesn't reconcile with my personal concept. And, and that elder pulled me aside and said, look, Son, you're not running to be a politician. You're running to be a leader. And so I began to embrace the role of elected office as a sacred and an honored uh, duty, privilege, and responsibility. And then shortly after I got elected, uh, tribal leaders asked me to run for um, president of the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians, ATNI. And I thought, uh, there's no way I'm ready for that. I, I barely have things together at Quinault. And uh, an elder said, look, another elder from another tribe told me, look, you just have to know and understand people see you, see things in you that you don't see in yourself. And you just have to to honor that. And, and so even though I felt wholly unprepared, not ready, um, I, I surrendered. I surrendered everything that is about me to the will of the tribal nations in my region to see if, if that's what they wanted. And the same thing with NCI. It was just one of those uh, opportunities where tribal leaders um, talked to me. And, and it really is about honoring uh, those around you and, and wanting to serve uh, others around you. And, and, and those kind of positions just come about. Yes, they do. And uh, I, it reminds me of a lot of very chance encounters I've had in my own lifetime um, where I've received, been a recipient of some of that elder knowledge um, without even looking or asking for it. So I really think that be, just being aware and conscious and in the present moment also um, does help us in our journeys. Um, well, uh, if you do you have any closing comments that you'd like to, to, to impart on us before you have to leave, and, and we'll transition a little early into our next um, presenter after you. Yes, excellent. Well, I, again, I just thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, and yes, to all the youth, the young people who are, are watching, uh, just know that, that you have a very special calling, and you have very special gifts. And it, it's uh, it, it, it's necessary to to follow that because those gifts are not only for you as an individual, but when you honor that and, and you follow that that path, you're going to find that not only is your future unimaginable, those good things, but other people in other parts of your nation, other parts of your region, other parts of the country, and quite frankly, around the world are going to find that what you bring to the table is invaluable and it's necessary. So I would just continue to, you know, encourage our young people. And every time I hear our young people present, I think to myself, our future is in such good hands. Because I grew up in a day and a time where we, you know, we were discouraged from a lot of things. And now a Quinault who is born today can, can learn their language. We, we have an entire language department. They can go out in a canoe. They can do these things and so i just know that um, our generation we accomplished a lot but that generation that all of you belong to that's up and coming and emerging uh boy you, you've got quite a, a future and i think you were coming into a, a profession and adulthood at a time when times couldn't be any more challenging and there's a reason for that and that is it's a gift to you because you are born for this moment. You're destined for this moment. And there's no question uh, you're going to be ready for this moment. So uh, I continue every young person just to follow that, that guidance and, and that wisdom and, and get out of your comfort zone and know that there are things that are beyond what you can see today and just follow it and, and enjoy the ride because it's, a, it's, it's quite a, a bold and dashing adventure. Well, Fawn, we uh, couldn't think of a better way to end our adult track today, and we just really are blessed to have you um, here with us today, and just know that this is recorded, and we will be sharing this with uh, quite a few folks, and, and I think that your message is so inspiring, and um, again, thank you so much. Yes. See you, Quill. And as um, Fawn logs off, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping while we get prepared for our next session. Uh, we um, wanted to just remind folks about our communications and outreach survey. 
uh, yesterday at the closing, I, I did mention that we had some really great comments and suggestions on how we can improve some of those ideas we would love to implement um, as time uh, makes it available. Uh, some of those particular items were that we can um, ha host regional meetings uh, or state uh, sorry, state regional meetings with all of our tribes uh, through Zoom potentially uh, to get some of that input and, and two-way conversations going between our tribal reps and our tribes and then our tribal reps and our EPA folks. Um, there's, but there's just been some really great uh, comments on there. We do encourage you all to fill out that survey. If you look at the bottom of your page, there's a circle with a lowercase i. Click on that and it will take you right to a link to fill that out. 